All right, we are now live on Facebook. So I wanna welcome everyone to the Kansas House District 10 Forum. Uh, I wanna also say that uh, this is an election that will be decided in the primary. So there's no Republican challenger running and this is uh, therefore an election that will be decided on August 4th. So that's coming up soon. Uh, I am Ty Edwards. I am the Women for Kansas Northeast chapter co-leader and this will be broadcast live on Women for Kansas Facebook. So it's W4KNE Facebook Live. And then we will also post it on Women for Kansas YouTube thereafter. I wanna thank the candidates, Brandon Holland, Christina Haswood and AJ Stevens for joining us today. Uh, I sent out to them in advance uh, the number of questions and the order we will answer them in. I can also help you as we go through to make sure that we get that in the same order. And we're gonna do three minute answers for each. I'll just say time if you reach the time limit. And then we are folding introductions into question one, but there will be closing remarks, also three minutes each at the end. Okay? All right, so let's start with number one. So please state your name, what is your background, and why would you be a good choice for the 10th district? And we'll start with Stevens. Oh, you're muted, AJ, you're muted. <laughs> no problem. You know, it's funny, I watch these and everybody does it and I think I won't do that. Okay. Um, my name is AJ Stevens. Um, my background a little bit, uh, I've got pretty equal experience between the public sector, uh, nonprofit and for-profit. Um, my most recent experience was uh, serving as president of city council for Baldwin City. Uh, during that time, we, we accomplished quite a bit. We were able to balance the budget and, uh, and still have a half dozen quality of life projects and um, and I, I found that I was pretty good about with, with dip, diplomacy and, and finding common ground. And uh, that was important to me as far as um, being able to accomplish something. Um, I know I was told the other day that, uh, that you could always count on me walking out with something, you know, when I walked into a negotiation. And, and, uh, and I feel like those little wins really make a difference. You know, you get a couple little wins and they start adding up. Um, I also am the executive director for Midland Railway which is a local nonprofit that, um, that educates youth. It's an educational nonprofit um, educating about the history of uh, Kansas railroads. And um, we're actually an operating historic railroad that runs uh, the Polar Express, um, Thomas the Train and events like that. Um, and a major economic driver in our community. Uh, before that, uh, I spent about 20 years in higher education. Um, and also as, as a teacher, I taught eighth grade math for a little while. Um, worked at a half dozen universities as a coach and administrator. And that's where a lot of my pub public sector experience comes in. I, I mean, when you have to deal with state budgets, I mean, when you work for a state university, those are always going to be a part of it. Um, but the, to be honest, it was nothing working with line items on, on athletics compared to what it was going to municipal government and looking at this 42 page document and trying to figure out where the fluff is and where we can find funding so that we don't have to increase the cost of living for people. Uh, beyond that, I, I spent some time when I was younger. I've always had a call to serve. Uh, I grew up in extreme poverty and, and was the oldest child, so I have that, that syndrome with the oldest child that I, I'm always trying to fix everything. And uh, So the first place I started was in Boy Scouts, and I, and I was an urban scout leader. We went into inner city schools, and they would yell, the scout man's here, and about 100 kids would come running down the hallway to the auditorium. And, and we teach them the scout house and all that. And then I went out and fundraised to, uh, to be able to make sure everyone would go to camp. Um, went over time there, so thank you. <laughs> You're good. All right, so next is uh, Haswood. Hello, my name is Christina Haswood. I'm a public health professional and a lifelong resident of District 10. I attended Lawrence Public Schools before earning my associates from Haskell Nations University. And after graduating with my bachelor's of science from Arizona State University, I moved on to the University of Kansas Medical Center, where I just recently graduated with my master's in public health and management in May. I'm currently working as a research assistant for the National Council of Urban Indian Health, a nonprofit, um, federal nonprofit, in the Center, Center for American Indian Community Health at KU Med, investigating issues such as tribal youth nicotine addiction and the COVID-19 effects on native populations. And in these unprecedented times, we need strong public health leadership now more than ever in the state capital. Not only would I listen to public health expertise in Topeka, I would provide it. 
I will be a strong advocate for implementing a scientific and adequate response to COVID-19 to ensure we save as many lives as we can. Uh, for this reason, expanding Medicaid is one of my top priorities because there's no reason to leave 150,000 Kansans vulnerable and uninsured um, from receiving access to affordable health insurance in the middle of a pandemic, especially since they're already paid for it. And speaking for vulnerable populations, um, I want to address racial tensions that are we, we're seeing here in Lawrence as well as across the country. And first of all, I do want to say that Black Lives Matter. Second of all, in my role as a researcher, I have seen firsthand the effects of systematic racism has on the health of vulnerable populations and in the Black community in particular. We must actively defend, support, and uplift our Black brothers and sisters if we ever hope to live more in a just and equal society. And one of the keys to achieving this better society of uh, equality education, I am a proud product of the Lawrence Public Schools and I understand the importance of keeping our public schools funded to provide quality education in an equitable manner and to ensure, ensure our students graduate with the skills to be successful in their post-education journeys. And that's why I'm, the prou I'm proud to be the only candidate in this primary who has the endorsement of K and EA and the teachers that they represent right here in Douglas County. And speaking of endorsements, I'm happy to have the support of our current 10th district representative, Eileen Horn, an inspirational leader, who I know we're all very sad to lose as our voice in Topeka, but I am proud that she has placed her trust in me to replace her, as have Lawrence Mayor Jennifer Ananda and former Governor Kathleen Sebelius, the Greater Kansas City Women's Political Caucus, and Emily's List, along with many others. In politics, there's often a choice between youth and experience, and I believe my candidacy offers a rare opportunity to like both at once. Not only would I be the youngest current member of the Kansas legislature, I'd also be just the third Native American member in its history. I believe my voice is the best to fight for the underrepresented populations of Douglas County, including our youth and people of color. I am qualified and ready to be the next progressive leader in the State House. I look forward to the discussion ahead. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and next, Brandon? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, well, uh, I'm Brandon Holland. I am also a product of the Lawrence K through 12 public education system. I moved to Douglas County when I was four years old from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, after uh, graduating from LHS in 2007, I studied political science and Arabic at KU. And it was during this time in college where I faced some real personal struggles. Uh, I played rugby for the Kansas Jayhawk Rugby Football Club. And um, I suffered numerous repeated concussions, and this gave me brain trauma. This led me to have some pretty serious mental health issues for years. Um, I eventually found a doctor that could help me, but the problem was my insurance didn't cover it, and the bills uh, racked up to tens of thousands of dollars. I'm a working man. I'm a wage earner. There was no way I could have afforded that on my own. Uh, fortunately for me, uh, my family is privileged enough and fortunate enough to, you know, have been able to provide, you know, to afford that treatment for me. So I was able to get my life back, but I know that's not the case for far too many Kansans. Um, we have a serious problem with mental health parity in this state, uh, in addition to the lack of Medicaid expansion. And I feel that those two issues are the most pressing needs that, uh, that need to be addressed. Um, I think those could start as like the, the best equalizers to begin with. I think everybody needs to be able to you know, compete in the marketplace and on a level playing field. Um, you need to be well in order to advance your uh, life in this country. And especially in the coming days, uh, the state's facing a $1.37 billion shortfall going through next summer. And in the past, we've seen that whenever budget gets tight, the uh, first targets for cuts are schools and the social safety net. I wanna be in Topeka to protect the most vulnerable in our communities and our public schools from these cuts. As a working man, I know firsthand um, how devastating uh, physical injury or mental illness can be on a worker's livelihood because I had both. I had a physical injury that led to mental illness. Um, I, I can't think of a more cruel and inhumane way to treat our citizens and to deny them health coverage. And that is my number one mission in office, true uh, Medicaid expansion and true mental health parity. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the first one on this next one will be Brandon again. 
So what should be the role of the state legislature in fighting COVID-19 and how will you enact this in office? So I think, uh, especially, you know, you know, observing the federal government's response to COVID-19 that the states really have to step up. And what I think we can do the most is first focus on the negative effects of COVID-19 on working people. Uh, so I support um, extending the moratorium on evictions and also uh, utility shutoffs. I believe that we have to make our own rules when it comes to schools, whether or not they reopen. Um, I think nationally we're seeing this rush to reopen. If schools, you know, just after we saw what happened with the rush to reopen business in the economy, COVID is spiking. We know children can spread COVID just as much at, you know, just as, uh, uh, just as frequently as uh, adults. And so we have to make sure that any education plan that we have we're getting kids back into schools it has to be safe. And we have to make sure that schools have funding to enact these uh, measures. On top of that, I believe that we need to extend, extend unemployment benefits uh, from the state uh, for, um, you know, for unemployed workers who are actively seeking work. Um, COVID-19 is, you know, a huge drain on our state's resources, but you know, it's also hurting workers. Workers can't get by without this aid and we need to make sure that people can spend money. Uh, I also think we need to eliminate this uh, food sales tax. And it's uh, really disappointing that we have one of the highest uh, food sales, ta uh, food sales uh, re uh, tax rates in the country. And it's another uh, shining example of regressive policies in the state that seem intentionally designed to hurt, you know, working people um, so these, these small things that are systemic all have to be addressed simultaneously in order to get people, you know, the individual tension that they can, uh, you know, they need to you know, survive and thrive. Thank you. Okay, AJ? Yes, could you repeat the question again, please? Sure. What should be the role of the state legislature in fighting COVID-19 and how will you enact this in office? Absolutely. Um, well, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll hit the ground running. Uh, even before I would take office, I'd start making calls to uh, reach across the aisle and, and start finding out where the give and take is, because that's what's really going to be, you know, especially as the minority party, we're going to have a real tough time going in and, and setting the standard for the agenda, but we can't move it. You know, it's just, a, it's a key of listening to what, what the needs are and, and what can be seen as a win-win, because at the end of the day, if we can find a win-win, then, then we're going to be successful. And, and that goes back to, you know, the little wins make up big results. Um, I think the first thing with us is going to be support Governor Kelly. I mean, she's done a great job as far as getting information out there and, and keeping us involved. Um, she's really doing her best to, to work um, with, to be honest, a lot of av adversity as far as different groups uh, resisting um, science-based data that she's presenting as far as the safety of our children and of our seniors. Um, but number one, though, for me, I, I, I truly believe that th this will be resolved with healthcare professionals outside of the legislature. We've got great medical professionals nationwide, some trying to make a dollar, some trying to do what's right for society, but they're looking to get this resolved. And, and what I'm really worried about, and this is why I'm running, is I, I'm worried about the outcome after that. I mean, as Brandon said, there, there's a, it sounds like you said over a billion, that's newer numbers than I have. Uh, shortfall next year. That's going to be devastating to our small business. It's going to be devastating to our, our working class. Um, first thing I would do is um, do everything we can to, to mitigate the damage and and find little ways to fix that. There's no home run to fix that shortfall. Um, what we can't do is we have to keep funding in education. That has to increase. We have to expand it in Medicaid. Uh, it has to be done, and, and this exposes that. What we need to do is we need to stop protecting the top 1% in the state start taxing them, agree, get rid of the food tax because it's regressive, um, and start finding ways to actually bring income rather than protecting the big business and the wealthy. Because I'll tell you what, the top 10, 10 people in this state could really make a big difference if they paid their fair share. Um, the catch is, how do we get the Republican Party and the majority to go with that? And I think that is with um, 
some trade-offs talking about green energy in Western Kansas and creating jobs for them that they, they can take credit for. So that they can call it a win and we'll get a win, they get a win and we get a trade-off. And to be honest, green energy is a win for us too. So thank you. Thank you. Christina? The issue of COVID-19 is extremely personal to me. Um, I am Navajo from the Navajo Nation, I'm born and raised here in Lawrence, and all my family, um, majority of my family lives on the reservation, which has the highest cases and the highest death rates of COVID-19 and being invisible in the national data um, for that reason. And just to see this personally getting close and into my family, um, I've been personally uh, aware and a large advocate um, trying to be on the COVID-19 regulations and for people to take this seriously. I strongly believe with COVID-19 and our state legislatures, we should prioritize people's health first and foremost before we can rebuild um, Kansas and the economy. We can't rebuild Kansas without healthy Kansans to um, rebuild uh, uh, what we need when COVID-19 came into and destruct our um, communities. One of the biggest things that has come to my attention that really isn't getting too much attention in the media is contact tracing with COVID-19 where we have, a, uh, we have someone who has received COVID-19 case and follow up with them. Um, there has been some efforts, but it's as we can see in the state that a lot of these efforts that are being implemented at the state with uh, Governor Kelly um, are being questioned of infringing on local policies, which shouldn't be taken into, into that manner. We're trying to implement public health practices and policies. COVID-19 is not gonna stop at your county borders if you choose not to mandate your mask. We're trying to protect lives here. We're trying to save lives here. And we already saw in Douglas County that we had two deaths, one recent death and one death that has been resolved as a COVID-related illness that was happened a couple months ago. And with that, it's just showing more importance that this can come into, into our lives, into our communities. Anytime, we were Douglas County, we were in like New York Times showing that we were this great county who's following public health um, precautions. Now look at us. When we slack just a little bit, the virus can come in at any time and destroy our families and um, you know, take people off their health insurance. There's such a tie between health insurance and employment that we really need to break that tie when we need to expand Medicaid so we don't leave those vulnerable populations out in the cold during a pandemic. Also, the mask mandate is something I like to touch on as it has become a political statement, which I strongly don't agree with. Um, if you feel it, it's, you know, a, a political statement now, we really need to change the stigma around that. And I really look to our leaders who ha come from these larger groups that don't believe. We need to make decisions based on science reason, evidence-based decisions. COVID-19, we still don't know the full effects of it and how if someone has COVID-19, what's, what's going to happen to them in a couple of years later. Um, and we see that herd immunity isn't working in um, international cities as well. And we really need to make decisions evidence-based. We don't have time to wait weeks or days. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so Christina, you'll be going first on this next one. What should be the legislature's funding priorities and how should the state raise the revenue to pay for them? The big issue for the next legislative session is the budget cuts with COVID-19 um, taking away from our normal tax taxing system. I think our taxing system, the regressional tax where we tax like property tax and food tax that disproportionately affect low income peoples and communities. Um, we can come up with a more innovative way of taxing our systems and re, re, re advising that as well. Um, and I believe that how we should come through this, uh, I guess, budget cuts is to definitely not touch the public education funding at all. Um, we do need to prioritize that and value, value those. And I believe another great solution that we're all in favor of is legalizing cannabis, marijuana. I understand that this is a really good solution, but it's not a permanent solution. If we do look at Colorado, it did jolt their economics um, for several years, but it's not a long sustainable solution. And that itself has its own concerns um, with T THC potency and making sure that qualified people um, are, are doing that as well. Um, and with the budget cuts, I think we really need to sit down and prioritize what we can and cannot 
um, want to cut from. And I believe that we can think of more innovative solutions to, to save here and there. And I will admit that I am a public health professional, not an economics or um, financial professional. So I do wanna open the invitation for anybody who's listening out there, especially in my district who has this expertise um, to come to me and educate me more on these issues. Also with you know, the unemployment rate, we need to more invest into more our um, local jobs that are already here. Thank you. All right, next, Brandon. Well, I think our state's funding priorities have to be the investments that we make in our workers and um, our, our, our poorest uh, citizens. Uh, number one, <clears throat> to raise revenue, uh, it, there's no question we have to raise uh, marginal income tax rates on the wealthy. It's, it's just simply completely backwards, uh, you know, the tax rates that we pay in this state. Um, and, you know, we saw it start with uh, Governor Brown back. And when he cut off one of the legs from that three-legged stool, the, you know, the economy collapsed. And then we get cuts to uh, schools and then social safety net. So we see what happens when we don't have adequate revenue coming in from the wealthiest earners. On top of that, we have to make sure that those cuts that are going to have to be made, there are going to be tough choices, tough decisions to be made in this next year. We have to make sure that doesn't go to uh, towards funding or we have to make sure we can't uh, don't cut K through 12 education, uh, public universities or the state universities as well. Um, Medicaid expansion also is a big priority because I believe with so many people just one uh, health emergency away from having to declare bankruptcy, there is a lot of fear to go out and spend your money. And especially with COVID-19 going on, um, we are a consumer uh, driven economy and people need to spend money in order for us to uh, you know, expand their economy. It's not gonna happen if people are feeling scared. So we have to you know, get COVID-19 under control or at least take as many medicating steps as we can in order to make people more comfortable to go out and make those purchases and fill state revenue coffers. Thank you. AJ? Thanks, Ty. Can you repeat the question? Sure. What should be the legislature's funding priorities and how should the state raise the revenue to pay for them? Absolutely. So this is what I'm good at. I, I, I'm the person on this forum that has extreme experience in public finance. I, I was the chairman of the, of the finance committee for Baldwin City Council when I served as the president uh, of the council. Um, we issued a balanced budget we managed to prevent any utility increases the entire time I was on. And oftentimes I was, on, I was a single person fighting that, um, trying to protect the, the people that were struggling to, to feed their children every night. Um, I will hit the ground running on this. There's, there's no learning curve for me at, at all. Um, I'm ready to go to this. Uh, it's not an easy fix. And, and we all agree we need Medicaid expansion. This, this shows this. Right now what's going on, it shows that it is a, it is a public right to, to have, have uh, Healthcare. Uh, with that said, dollars don't just magically appear. And as a minority party, we've got to be able to go in there and and reasonably discuss with the majority party something that'll be palatable for them as well. So this is this is going to take much more than just screaming. I know what I'm talking about. I mean, it's going to take diplomacy. It's going to take uh, compromise, and it's going to take an, a, a willingness to give away some things. I, I would never give away fossil fuels. But there are other things we can give away to rural Kansas uh, that is predominantly red that, that will be okay for them. Um, I do want to say, though, because it's, it's not true, um, in May in Colorado, they had record sales, $192 million in recreational marijuana. It is a growing industry that is th thriving year after year, maximum profits, and it saved their highways, it saved their education, and it has far surpassed their, their lottery numbers. So the thought that that's not sustainable, what's great about legalized marijuana is I think we're already there for medical. I think the other side's ready for that. Um, you know, our, our leaders have worked hard on that. But right now with this economy, I think we can get the other side to agree to recreational too with science-based facts because it's going to save our economy. And, and the idea is not sustainable. It's just not. What we're going to do is we're going to take that underground economy and bring it back up and start taxing it. There's people right now that are making revenue from selling marijuana 
under the table that aren't being taxed, and we're not getting our part of that either. It, it can end up being massive savings for us. It, it's not going to recover short term for what we're doing, but the growth will allow us to fund education you know, in a strong way, where parents have what they would need, where, where teachers don't have to buy supplies and they, and they get treated fairly. It, it's going to allow us to fix our highways. It's going to allow us to get mental health and substance abuse, which we desperately need substance abuse and treatment. I mean, I, I have a family member, it took us two weeks to find some place that would take her for inpatient. And that is astonishing. We need it. And we need it here in Lawrence. We need it in Douglas County. And the way to pay for it is to go after aggressive things. It'll be a win-win for both sides. And marijuana is one of them. I mean, you look at a Fort Hayes State did a study. I know you're getting ready to shut me off. Fort Hayes State did a study and, and Kansas want this. So it's a win. And, and it's sustainable and the numbers are there, the facts are there, long-term growth that will continue to go. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay, so you have started all of you to address this, but this is my next question. And AJ, you'll go first on this one. What healthcare reforms will you support in the Kansas House? Yeah, uh, that's an easy one. I mean, we're going in there, we're asking for, for expansion. Um, we're already paying for it. I mean, you're gonna hear the same thing from all three of us. The question is, how, how do we get that to happen? Um, we get that to happen by, by making sure that people are held accountable for what they say in the state house, making sure that the press knows it, and making sure constituents know it. Because right now there are people in, in Western Kansas or rural Kansas that are losing hospitals at an astonishing rate because the, the, the funding's not there. So there, there are people in Outwood and, well, not Outwood, Outwood has a great hospital, but so, some other place out in Western Kansas where you have to go an hour and a half just to get treatment for a heart attack. How does that work? Um, and those are red areas. So we really need to start pointing those out and really get that done. That needs to be the first thing we do. But the problem is there's such a massive shortfall in income that there's going to have to be a find a way to pay it. Because like I say, these dollars don't just magically appear. So it's going to take somebody going through. And that's what I do. I went to law school for regulatory compliance. I'm one of those like legislative nerds. I enjoy reading that stuff. And I dig through it. I write it. I've written legislation. And I, I, I'm telling you, I'm the one here that has done this. There's no on-the-job training. I will hit the ground running and, and to be honest, have stuff on day one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christina? I think Medicaid expansion is definitely one of our biggest priorities as well. Um, but we saw a lot during this pandemic as well as underlying issues of other community, vulnerable communities that need the health reform as well, such as a disability community where 15,000 Kansans could have gained healthcare insurance um, you know, during Medicaid expansion. Also, we saw a statistic where 37 expanded Medicaid states, 23% of them got laid off um, that did expand Medicaid, but states like ours that haven't expanded Medicaid, that statistic rose to 43% of workers becoming uninsured during the pandemic. Um, small businesses also can benefit from the Medicaid expansion, where we have a lot of small business here in Lawrence and Baldwin City, um, where we want to employ employees, we want to give them a, a, an equitable wage, but the company simply does not have enough to um, provide health insurance. Um, so I think those are really important um, st uh, statistics as well, to realize that not only do we want to expand just to the res regular Kansans, um, but also that we're paying it in our federal tax um, monies where when we pay for federal taxes, the states in the United States that expanded Medicaid, our dollars are going to those states, not to us. So that in simplicity doesn't make any sense. Um, and then also for other healthcare reforms, I think that there's other vulnerable populations that really need um, the spotlight as well. And I guess just personally, I work with tribal health programs as well and talking to them up at Prairie Band Potawatomi, um, Kickapoo, Sac and Fox, and the Iowa tribes of Kansas, Nebraska. They have an issue too with their healthcare systems where they need the state's help with expanding Medicaid where back in, you know, on the reservation in Mayetta, Kansas, a lot of their citizens live in Topeka. Um, and when they can't get a health appointment at their Indian Health Services, they need to fall back onto the Medicaid healthcare insurance system. Um, well, that's not expanded. There's a lot of people falling through these loopholes as well, and accessibility is an issue too, and as well as in our rural areas as well. Thank you. Brandon? Well, I'm going to be bold and first say that we need to expand Medicaid. Um, <laughs> I think um, you know, that, that is obviously the number one goal. We have to get healthcare, uh, we have to make healthcare, healthcare accessible to everyone. There's currently over 150,000 people out there who do not have health insurance, and 
that has to change instantly. But simultaneously with, uh, with, with that, we need to enact the Christy L. Bennett Mental Health Parity Act. Now, Christy L. Bennett was a, is a woman from Payola who just last year um, was having a serious mental health crisis and knew that she needed inpatient treatment. She thought that she had been approved uh, to go to, the, to a clinic in Texas. Uh, she had her plane ticket, she was ready to go, and then uh, she gets a call from the clinic saying that her health insurance company is not going to cover it. Um, basically saying because she wasn't suicidal, it wasn't necessary for her to go get this treatment. She decided to stage a suicide attempt, and unfortunately, she actually died. That's the kind of a hoops that people are having to jump through just to get mental health care in this state. And that is, I mean, it, the story is heartbreaking. I've spoken with her father, and you know, he's a very good man, and just you know, hearing about this happen to anyone, especially, you know, someone so young and, you know, so promising as uh, Christy, you know, to, you know, to, you know, have to lose them in such a way is, uh, is a travesty in my opinion. Um, Christy L. Bennett Mental Health Care, uh, Mental Health Care Parity Act closes the loopholes that insurance companies currently exploit to skirt paying for mental health care um, technically, we do have uh, parity in this state, but we only get a D rating as because of all those loopholes uh, that companies are able to use. So this act um, pretty much codifies and forces insurance companies to treat mental health care the exact same as, you know, you know, every other health care, because you know, at the end of the day, mental health care is health, um, you know, you know you know, strong body, strong mind, you need both, uh, and especially in today. And we're seeing, we're going to see, you know, more and more rises in mental health cases because of COVID-19 and people being stuck in their homes, you know, with, uh, you know, domestic abusers, uh, and children just being isolated from their peers. So Christy L. Bennett Mental Health Parity Act would be the number one priority to make sure that we can address those issues. Thank you. All right, Christina, you'll be first on this next one. What criminal justice reform is needed in our state and what specific legislative action will you take to ensure that Black Lives Matter and poverty or homelessness are not criminalized? Yeah, this is a really big issue in our community as well, um, state and country as well. And with the Black Lives Matter movement, they have not only amplified uh, their voices that they've been trying to speak for hundreds and you know tens of thousands of years um with the the murder of george floyd it really escalated this and even um we can see it in our own local races with the sheriffs and the district attorneys how they're really stepping up and handling these issues as well um, i think eliminating qualified immunity which is the presumption of good faith allowing bad cops to become repeated offenders is something that we can implement uh requiring malpractice insurance for police uh, violent cops um, will be priced out of a job if we implement this and expanding whistleblower protections so we have an environment where employees can feel comfortable reporting um, bad practices happening in their workplaces. And this comes from personally knowing the history uh, with my own peoples and the Black Lives Matters. They have been for the beginning of time of uh, civil rights movements have been hand in hand combating these racial injustice and the disproportionates of our statistics of who's getting incarcerated. Um, I think there is an issue with data transparency here in Douglas County, where the newest report on looking at any type of statistics was in 2016. And it's really hard to look at what's happening now in 2020, and especially with COVID-19, um, imp implementing our, uh, our criminal justice systems and seeing who's getting disproportionately um, incarcerated. With the issues of homelessness, um, I do not believe that we should criminalize homelessness. We should give people homes, um, first of all, and providing services and social services to help people get back on their feet and to help re rehabilitize them back into society. We should not criminalize people just because we don't have a solution for them. We should create solutions and want people to be better for themselves and for their families and for our community. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, Brandon. Good 
Uh, I think we uh, all here can agree that there is a 400-year-old uh, problem of systemic racism in this country, <clears throat> and it has shown its face in every single one of our institutions. And unfortunately, that, that obviously includes uh, our police forces around the country. I think that police brutality nowadays, um, you know, think it, it's getting the media attention it deserves, but it's been around forever. It's not like this is some brand new problem that only now, you know, we see that we have to fix it. It's been there forever. Um, uh, as far as legislative priorities, I'd say that, uh, yeah, qualified immunity is number one that we have to get rid of, although that, that is kind of a complex issue, um, just judging because it is a constitutional issue, not just a legislative one. Um, I think that the number one way that people will trust their police forces again is to mandate citizen review boards over uh, every community police department. The only way that people will truly believe that, you know, we are, our police are comporting themselves, you know, professionally is to have, you know, our, have our neighbors, you know, looking over these records, looking over body cam footage, looking over reports to make sure that our police are behaving responsibly. We also have to set our police up for success. Now, I don't, I don't agree with the term defund the police because I think it's just terrible wording and that's not what people are actually trying to accomplish. We need to invest some money that is allotted to police into other programs because the police aren't trained mental health professionals. That's not what they are trained to do. So we should stop expecting them to be the first responders to mental health crises. Um, we need to take some money from the police that, you know, that has been allotted to them. We need to diverge that to, you know, mental health, you know, community mental health services like Burt Nash uh, here in Douglas County, where they respond to mental health crises because, you know, we see with the you know, disproportionate um, amount of disproportionate rate of violence towards black men. How many of these interactions are we seeing that end, uh, you know, fatally for these men? How many of them are mental health crisis? And we also see that, you know, white men having a mental health crisis are far less likely to be shot and killed than a black man having health mental, a mental health crisis. So I think that we absolutely have to fund, um, you know, not, you know, we have to fund other people besides the police, you know, in order to respond to all these different uh, emergencies. Thank you. AJ? Yes. Um, it's great. You know, I, no matter who you guys elect, I mean, all three of us politically are pretty similar, um, especially on the important things that matter to our, our constituents uh, in District 10. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try not to repeat the, the key points everybody keeps saying, but there, I do have some that are unique. Um, I mean, number one, you know, we have to stop criminalizing poverty, which has been said, but that, that's exactly what's happening. Um, we have to get cash bail. It has to be done. And we're fortunate that we have candidates at the local level that are, that are also supportive of that. But th this needs to be done statewide. I mean, poverty isn't just in our district. Um, we have to end civil asset for forfeiture. It, it has to stop. It's just straight up theft. Um, private prisons, are you kidding me? I mean, that, that's just, it's ridiculous. I mean, and that takes us right back to legalizing marijuana. I mean, you legalize marijuana and you end cash bail, all of a sudden we're saving money on the prison system compared to what we have budgeted right now. And that helps resolve some of our budgetary issues in the short term and helps give a quality and fair treatment. Um, but on top of that, and I, and I haven't heard anybody say this, but I truly believe this, as somebody that's worked with youth for over 20 years, um, not only is marijuana, but we need to quit treating all other substance as a crime and, and start treating it as what it is, and that's addiction. I mean, nobody goes out and says, I'm going to start stealing stuff so I can become addicted to a drug. It goes the other way around. And, and so when people are caught with drugs that are uh, other than marijuana, we need to send them immediately to treatment. And it has to be available. We can't just take them for a night and then release them and let them go back and have to deal with those cravings and those chemical dependencies. I mean, it has to be done. We, we, we need to restructure how we're treating this. Um, which brings me to a whole other issue that nobody else talking about, which is restorative justice. I mean, if it's a nonviolent crime, let's, have, let, let's bring in a restorative justice program. Castle Rock, Colorado has a fantastic one. There's, there's 50 other ones throughout the state minimum 
um, where you bring the victim and you bring the, and the, the person that, that committed the crime together and they find common ground and they find resolution without all the court fees and without the jail time and such. And, and, and truly, I think, helps heal better. Um, the other thing is we need independent oversight. Every, every single law enforcement agency should have independent oversight. There should be extreme penalties for shutting off your body cam. There has to be uh, malpractice insurance on every one of the officers. Um, the unions, I'm pro-union. My dad was a union laborer his whole life. Um, but when it comes to law enforcement, more often than not, that union, I mean, you see it over and over, that union leader is out there just trying to circle the wagons. And that has to stop. I mean, you hear all the time, good cops don't like bad cops. Show us. Show us by turning people in that are wrong, keeping your cameras on, and make sure that, that people are held accountable, because that's how it happens. Some of that can be done in legislation, but to be honest, a lot of it has to happen on the street. And that, that's a culture issue, and we have to address that because culturally, if that's how they're being trained, that's what they're doing. I'm telling you right now, I've talked to law enforcement people I know. I'm way over, aren't I? Am I good? Okay, <laughs> there's one thing. I, I, I have kids I coach here in law enforcement. When you put your knee on the back of somebody's neck when they're on blacktop, that's not taught in law enforcement academy, but it is taught by their peers, and they know it will kill somebody. Straight up execution on the street. And they're, they're teaching it as part of their culture and it needs to stop and they need to be go to jail for it because they're, they're murderers. Thank you. All right, thank you, AJ. Okay, so Brandon, you'll be next on this first one and it's a little bit of a long question, so prepare yourselves. In late 2019, early 2020, the Kansas City Star did a series of articles investigating the foster care to prison pipeline. They found that in Kansas, one in three inmates in state prison had been in the state's foster care system. Removing children from their homes instead of prioritizing family preservation, multiple foster care placements, and homelessness after aging out of the system are just some of the problems these children face. What actions will you take in the legislature to address these issues? And Brandon, you're first. Well, uh, I think that um, the situation that happened with our foster care system is uh, a sad but perfect example of Republican leadership or, you know, Republican um, majority governments weaponizing bureaucracy to make it so terrible to use that it doesn't work anymore. And I think the, uh, the foster care system is a you know, great example of that because you know, we had kids sleeping in offices. Um, we have children missing. Um, and, you know, when you hear these numbers, it, it's just horrifying that the state is actually just losing children or, you know, just, you know, children are just running off. And obviously, you know, we're doing something wrong when, you know, one in three foster kids is ending up in prison eventually. So we need to have more than just, you know, we obviously need to invest more in foster care system. And, you know, I'd, I'd have to talk with, um, you know, family aid organizations to figure out what, what would be the best way uh, to do that. Um, I miss, you know, obviously we need more uh, education funding uh, we, and probably, you know, you know, more funding for at-risk youth, such as foster children, to make sure that they're getting the extra attention they deserve. That includes um, hiring uh, mental health experts in, in public schools um, so that children can, you know, you know, dealing with these, you know, terrible life circumstances of being in the foster care system so that they have someone to talk to um, in a school environment um, in order to help them get through everything. And, you know, again, I think it also just goes back to, you know, when people are aging out of the system, we have to make sure that there's something there to catch them if they fall. And the number one way to do that is, you know, again, expansion of Medicaid and mental health. Um, to me, that's really what everything can kind of come down to is that at the very least, what we can do is make sure that people are well. If we can do that first, we can work on the uh, next steps afterwards. Thank you. Uh, AJ? That was a doozy of a question. Can you say it again? I'm sorry. Yeah. So in late 2019, early 2020, the Kansas City Star did a series of articles investigating the foster care to prison pipeline. 
They found that in Kansas, one in three inmates in state prison had been in the state's foster care system. Removing children from their homes instead of prioritizing family preservation, multiple foster care placements, and homelessness after aging out of the system are just some of the problems these children face. What actions will you take in the legislature to address these issues? Yeah, this one hits home for me. I, you know, I, as I said before, I grew up, I, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a kid who, I mean, my family went out utilities or food for a year, you know? I mean, we, we were struggling immensely and, and that could have been me. It, it could have been, I was fortunate that it wasn't. Um, but I think number one, and, and this, this is gonna sound like I'm dodging the question, but I, I'm real big on hitting, like, how do we get here? You know, it's really as they sit back and look at the aftermath, but how do we get here? And I think number one, we need good jobs. I mean, we, we have the lowest minimum wage in the area. I mean, every, everybody else is $9 and higher around us, except for Oklahoma, and I'm not really comparing us to Oklahoma. Um, so $15 minimum wage is, is necessary, um, and it needs to be tied to inflation. It has to be, because if not, we're right back where we started from. 10 years ago, it was seven twenty five, and it's still seven twenty five. but yeah, you look at our balance, they're getting cost of living raises every year. Um, so as, as Brian likes to say, the wage earners, they need to be taken care of. Um, second, we need robust social systems, you know, and that has to come with Medicaid expansion, which we've already talked about. Um, we need childcare. We need childcare opportunities for people because right now people aren't earning a livable, livable wage and, and they can't take care of their kids when they both have to work, especially during COVID-19. Um, and I know these are all getting there, but how are these kids ending up in foster care? Um, Education, education is a golden key. We need to make sure that, that people are educated so generationally this system stops. Um, and we need more robust oversight and, and training um, and, and follow through. I mean, these, these agencies are severely underfunded from the brown, brown bag tax cuts. And we were just starting to recover from, from them at a time where you know, we're, we're almost a million dollars or over a billion, a billion dollars in the hole now for next year. Um, we, I mean, we just gotta bring compassion back to the state house. I mean. I'm a father of a 12 year old son and, and, and I'm raising my family in this district and it just crushes me that there's kids that go home and, and they don't get to eat at night. And, and it's, that, that's my call to service is to make sure that every kid that was like me isn't, isn't experiencing that. And, and the foster system is brutal. I mean, who knows what's happening to them during this when they're moved from home to home. I'm probably, am I over? Uh, no, you have a few more. Okay. 30 uh, seconds. So, I have a timer. I forgot to hit it. Uh, but, but really, I mean, that's it. The other thing we need to do is we, we need to start offering tax credits for adoption. And I know that's not consistent with what Democrats want, but perhaps people have children right now that they weren't equipped to take care of and they know it. And if we offer tax credits and made it easier to adopt, it might be a better option. Um, you need to see long-term uh, growth there. I mean, we're not going to see results. This is data that we're going to see hindsight. I mean, we may never see it, but somewhere we got to start. And it's going to come with, it's got to come with original ideas and not the same thing that we keep doing every year. Um, I mean, every year you go to the state house and everybody talks about the same things and it, it, it's going to take different thought. Thank you. Okay, time. Mm -hmm. Christina? I believe the foster care system here in Kansas is broken and needs to be refixed um, in that report, that news report, I think shocked not only the state of Kansas, but the entire country to show that we really need to pick it up here in Kansas for our foster kids. Um, it's a extreme disservice to see this happen. And um, you know, the foster care system in public health research, we look at it as one of the risk populations for going to the systems of um, you know, criminal justice systems where they go into jails and they go into prisons. Once you get introduced to one of these types of systems where uh, you know, society is saying we can't really provide for you yet. Um, they get familiarized with these systems and they believe that, you know, this is where I end up. This is, you know, the similar systems of packing your bag and, you know, living in a, a strange environment is similar to jail. Um, and in public health research, I work with missing and murdered indigenous peoples, looking more into the missing and murdered indigenous women's on reservations of indigenous peoples, but with peoples, we want to pay respects to the LGBTQ plus uh, community where trans people are more vulnerable 
vulnerable to homelessness, um, to murders, and this is just because of our systematic uh, systems. And here in Kansas, um, I know uh, the Appleseed Foundation of Kansas is doing a great job on really pushing and keeping our legislators accountable um, at the state level to bring our foster care kids the services that they need. And we need more um, social workers, too, to shift the funding of not only of, you know, finding, we also need to find more people who are willing to house um, the foster care uh, children and to make sure that we don't have discrimination policies against, uh, like, our community and the LGBTQ LGBTQ plus that are being discriminated for being foster parents when they're extremely qualified to do so in the first place. Um, and we really just need to keep accountable. We need to listen to the researchers and those who are really passionate and we need to listen to those who survive the system as well. And we can see in the data that disproportionately black and African American children in Kansas are in these foster care systems. And I'm not too sure of any data that release of those who got lost but I can speculate, you know, there's so much gaps in the data that we really need to see to data visualize for people to, to, to look, look, look at the numbers. We have, I've sat in at the state house in one of the testimonies um, to the committee and we have survivors coming up and we still don't have the results that we have in the state legislature. And I'm ready to be a big voice and a big um, fighter for those uh, children as well. I really think we need to really pick it up Thank you. All right, let's see. Okay, so uh, AJ, you'll be first on this next one. How will you address the lack of broadband and healthcare access for rural Kansans? And what other legislative actions should be taken to support rural communities? Absolutely, that, that's actually an easy one because Secretary Tolan is doing a great job with that and so is Governor Kelly. Um, and to be honest, the federal government is as well. Um, I mean, they put out bids over the last two years um, to build rural broadband everywhere. Um, that's something I, I directly understand though. Uh, here in Baldwin City, uh, we have a company called RG Fiber that is probably one of the first um, gigabit uh, rural businesses in, in the area. And, and again, guy named Mike Bosch, who's just done a fantastic job growing and he's, he's hit Baldwin, he's starting to hit other rural communities. I mean, what, what that takes, that just takes straight up investment. I mean, it's not happening any other way, um, but it's a good investment. And, and that's something I would support, especially getting out in the, in the rural areas, because it creates good jobs and it creates long-term jobs. I mean, those projects, for, for, for Mike to do, um, to hook up Baldwin City, it took him three years. So that's three years of great jobs for people. And, and a lot of those people go to the next community and continue to do thing, the same thing. And most of the teams are the same. Um, but until we do that, there's going to be a, a disparity between the haves and the have-nots. Um, it also hurts rural, rural Kansas as far as uh, job growth. I mean, it's, it's just not appealing for a company to go and, and move somewhere where they're, they're going to be using dial-up speed. Um, we're, we're just not that kind of, of society anymore. Um, but I mean, that's a hard one to talk three minutes about. I mean, we're, I think we're probably all for it. Um, it's just a matter of finding the money at a time when we're super short. I will say this, though. Um, at a time when we're short on money, which we're going to be, the best things we can do are create jobs. They are, because you create jobs, those dollars are gonna go into every small town, they're gonna to touch five businesses and create more jobs and so on. So spend local, make sure that we're creating jobs and making sure that, that we can re re reproduce that money and, and bring it back around and not have it leave the state. That, that you know what, one last thing, we need to quit giving outside, uh, outside contracts. The state, companies outside the state shouldn't be getting preference on these contracts and the money needs to stay in our state. Thank you. Sure. Christina? Yeah, I've had an opportunity to speak with the Douglas County Farm Bureau, and they express that this is an issue as well with broadband. And I believe this goes into the issues of the rural communities and agricultural communities where they have more advanced technologies of their tractors um, and their agricultural systems that require internet access to update the system. And uh, for bigger land areas, they have sprinklers that you know they can program to a certain day and a certain time. So broadband is not only important, but it's essential to give people um, you know, the job and the economics um, for them to live and put food on the table, roof over their head, cl clothes on their back. Um, we've also seen it too in uh, rural areas of the state of Kansas. I recently just listened to the Kansas um, Farm Bureau's podcast, and they talked about how here in COVID-19, where we had stay-at-home orders, 
it was extremely difficult for the rural areas that they, they didn't have internet service or they did have internet service, but it wasn't 5G, it wasn't fast enough for them to work from home. And I've talked to um, educators in Baldwin City where they said that, well, our kids are supposed to learn online, but you know, I don't have internet at home or my internet can't support um, you know, the learning uh, module or you know, the internet can't support three Zoom sessions of children taking a Zoom PE or you know, there's a lot of issues that we've seen. I think broadband and internet service now in our modern times is an essential service. It should be a right that we should all have access to broadband. And I think we're all seeing it right now. If we don't have the access, we don't have the speed of it. Um, and looking into these, these other issues as well too. Thank you. Brandon? Well, I think there are uh, numerous things that the state can do to help out uh, rural communities, but it, I think we don't have the resources to do it all by the state's government, uh, by the government itself. It needs to be um, a lot of public private partnerships um, to develop. As J AJ was talking about earlier, we, we definitely have to create jobs. Um, and so I think that, you know, Western Kansas is a great opportunity uh, for wind energy development and, you know, that, that could be an entirely new industry for Kansas workers, you know, employ a lot of them, you know, it'd be you know, a permanent job you know, industry wouldn't be going anywhere. Um, I think also that the state can incentivize, um, you know, these services like broadband going out to, uh, you know, rural communities on top of the, you know, like, you know, giving tax breaks or tax incentives to, you know, internet providers to, you know, extend their infrastructure out there. But also, in order to get doctors out to rural areas, we should be willing to, uh, we should pr pretty much just erase or be willing to completely erase uh, uh, medical school debt for brand new doctors if they move out to these rural areas. Um, a lot of times, you know, in these communities, the, uh, the, the one doctor is, you know, beyond where they should have retired, but, you know, they feel a sense of duty to stay on because they're the only medical professional, you know, within 20, 30 miles. So if we reward our younger doctors for going out to these, you know, more rural communities, I think that'd be a great way to slowly start building them up. And, um, you know, with more professionals moving to, you know, uh, in an area, it is going to develop more, it is going to grow. So I think that what the state can do is motivate and reward, um, people who are expanding services out West and just in the rural communities in any part of the state. Uh, you know, we can't, you know, have the government just buy all these things, but we can use the government uh, to, you know, help, you know, encourage and support these type of expansions. Thank you. Okay, this is the last question. After this, we'll do closing remarks. Okay, so Christina, you'll be first on this one. What action should the legislature take to protect people, the economy, and our environment from climate change? I think we start off great. Um, there was a bill introduced that recognized, I'd say it's a baby step, um, that was recognizing the state of Kansas that we are currently in a climate crisis. Um, and I think the state needs to take that extremely seriously. Um, not only is it important to climate um, advocates, um, but indigenous communities as well, where we want to make sure our natural lands aren't being destroyed um, by current modern, you know, pesticides and toxins, making sure our waters are clean, um, but also through the agricultural um, of our state without making sure our soils are rich enough to produce um, our crops so people can get their paychecks and to making sure that we exercise innovative solutions that we are capable of. And we did discuss here that wind energy, Kansas has a great potential and one of the leading states in wind energy and across the country. And um, you know, this was brought up that if we really invest in this company, we can bring jobs into creating um, wind energy turbines and creating factories here to maintain and um, have people do the maintenance of these wind energies. And if we push for sustainable solutions by 2030, we can pretty much run this entire state through sustainable solutions as well. Um, but I do believe that there is a luxury service with even just simply putting a solar panel on your house. Um, I've talked to a local um, 
solar system installer in Lawrence and I looked at their pictures of the great solar panels that they put on buildings and local homes and I noticed that these all these homes are nicely established three-car garage and I'm, I was just like wow we have a um, disparity of people who actually want to do um, you know sustainable solutions in, into their own personal homes as well. I think that should be more accessible and we should stop any discrimination tax of those who want to use, you know, solar or wind energy systems. And I, you know, I am ready to be a big voice and a big advocate. I have been endorsed by, um, you know, the Lawrence Kansas Sunrise Movement. I have been recently endorsed by the Kansas Sierra Club. So I'm ready to work with these organizations. They're ready to work with me and I'm ready to bring, you know, innovative solutions that we can to the state of Kansas and as well as our county, make it more accessible as well. Thank you. Uh, Brandon. Could you repeat the question, please? I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. What actions should the legislature take to protect people, the economy and our environment from climate change? Thank you. Well, climate change is a long-term problem. It's not going to be resolved overnight. Um, however, it needs to be addressed you know, pretty much immediately. And I think what the state legislature can do, uh, as I was talking about uh, uh, last question, is we have to incentivize and motivate companies to invest in uh, green energies and safe and uh, you know, good practices. Uh, we can't be awarding state contracts to just the, you know, the cheapest, uh, you know, the cheapest contractors on any construction project. We have to take and, you know, we have to keep in mind our business practices. If they're paying their workers enough, if they, you know, are fully insured, um, are they exploiting, you know, um, undocumented workers? Um, because climate change is a long-term problem, the, the the actions we take to address it are going to be long-term industries um yes kansas has the highest wind potential for energy in the country we have the windiest uh, city in the entire country colby kansas um we have to have to have to expand wind energy in this state because you know let's face it you know coal and natural gas are you know are killing the planet and everything living on it Wind doesn't. Now there are, you know, concerns that windmills actually do affect uh, raptors, you know, birds of prey and everything. But if we look at Europe, you know, they have models that, you know, ward off these birds. They aren't being killed or sucked into these giant wind turbines. The point is that there is so much that there is so much opportunity to invest and expand and build in terms of infrastructure and new energy and. Um, public works that, you know, all were to mitigate or um, help us to adapt to the uh, certain or the, uh, the consequences of climate change, because, you know, we know it's hot here and it's only going to get worse. So we need to do everything we can um, with the vast resources and opportunities we have to make the most out of it. We can hire and employ generations of a new workforce working on uh, green energy uh, infrastructure development. And I think that should be our number one goal. Okay, thank you. All right, AJ. Thank you, this one excites me because it's something I've been doing for years. Um, you know, recently I, I heard a quote that a uh, campaign should be earned, not bought. Um, and, and to be honest, it's offensive to me because I, I spent years um, working towards solar energy and green energy here in Baldwin City. We, um, we brought a, a public-private partnership where I was, I was president of the council, but I was also on the, on the committee that, that brought the, um, I was on the utility committee that brought the solar farm here. It was a budget neutral. Um, it, it was paid for by FRG. It's the first one they've done. Um, it's a megawatt. It, it gives us 20 years of, of power at a locked-in rate of five cents a kilowatt, um, which is going to be excellent for us because we get green energy and we control inflation. Where right now, the race can go up over and over and over again. That's how you earn a vote. That's how you earn an election right there. Um, and, and that's bothersome to me. I'll, I'll tell you the other thing is, is, you know, we had a cap um, where the wealthy could have solar here in Baldwin City. 
and we got rid of that. So 11 homes could have, have, have solar here and everybody else couldn't have it. Um, and we don't let net, we didn't allow net metering, which is absurd. Net metering means that when you're, uh, when you're pulling solar, you can push it back into the system and lower your bill. And so you actually get paid for that. And we actually block it in this state in a lot of the communities and it's, it's absurd. Um, I mean, if, if, if they're pushing fuel out there, they should get paid for that. But we're so ver worried about protecting the profits of our, either our municipalities or our, our electric companies are making money. As long as we're worried about that, we can't find any progress. So while I was on city council, we brought an, we, brought, we, we, we changed that metering. We made it so anyone in our community could, could have solar instead of the wealthy. We, um, we put in a one megawatt solar farm that was budget neutral and didn't raise our, our budget at all and, and at zero cost to our citizens, locked our, our, our rates in, and, um, and, and I'm, I'm living proof of it. So, I mean, you're here, everybody's watching right now. You're here to make a choice for the three of us. All three of us are great, but I'm telling you what, I've done this. I've been doing it for years. It's not a talking point for me. I've done it. Do your research, look at the website. I'm endorsed by you, the people. I don't care about anybody that doesn't live in our district endorsing me. I want your vote and I've been fighting for you for years and I will continue to do that. Thank you. Okay, great. Now we'll start with um, closing remarks. Uh, so first we're gonna go with Brandon. You'll have three minutes each for these. Uh, so Brandon, go ahead. Well, I wanted to thank you first off for uh, organizing this and letting us come on and uh, speak with everyone today. I think it is so important that, you know, we have people who are actually engaged and interested and who pay attention to our politics. I fear, I feel that uh, a lot of the dysfunction our country is uh, seeing today is a result of a certain level of apathy um, and, and or ignorance. So thank you folks for uh, fighting against that. Um, I have been fighting to elect people to office since I was 14 years old. Um, my dad is State Senator Tom Holland, but he is not the reason I'm in the race. However, because he's my dad, I have been involved in politics for a long time and I have seen the goings on. I have, I have been around, um, for quite a while. When I, my freshman year of college, I uh, interned for Congressman Dennis Moore in Washington, D.C., back when the 10th district here was part of the U.S. Congressional Third or Kansas Congressional Third. Uh, so I spent a summer in D.C., and that's where I developed just an awe and deep respect of the idea of the legislative body because. Not every single country in the world, you know, their citizens get to say, we actually elect our government. The people make the decisions. We elect who's writing these laws. And just, uh, I, I feel a deep reverence for it. Um, and it carried through even to state government. Um, a couple of years ago, I interned for Senator uh, David Haley in uh, Topeka. And, you know, that was another experience where I was sitting in on committee hearings and taking notes, sitting on caucus meetings and everything. I, I've, I have been immersed in this stuff for over half of my life. And I, I do not have um, I have 20 years of budgetary experience like AJ and I do not have a master's degree like Christina. But what I do have is on the ground experience and the personal connections. Um, I do have my poli sci degree as well. I have you know, dedicated my life to studying government and figuring out how to make it better. And also on top of that, you know, from my experiences, I want to help people who have suffered from mental health issues and, you know, and, and general health care uh, issues. But I don't see any other uh, way that I can do that. Or I see this as the way that I can help the most people like me, you know, have the most effect on it. Um, we need a voice for, you know, the average worker, you know, someone who, you know, is fighting for every single hour they get, you know, relying on that income just to get by. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you guys. I currently run a liquor store and I've been facing coronavirus every single day since this first came out. Um, I've been, you know, I've been scared about getting infected from, you know, customers walking in without masks. I will take that concern for working Kansans and the, and any Kansans who are struggling, feeling discriminated against, ignored, or targeted 
I will be there for you and I will make your voice heard. Thank you. Okay, Chris, uh, I'm sorry, let's see, where am I? Oh, AJ, you're next. Thank you, three minutes though. Uh-huh. All right, um, first of all, thank you, uh, Ty, I appreciate it. And, and um, thank you for the women for Kansas for, for hosting this. Um, we really did get overshadowed. I mean, I think the sheriff's last night said that they have had six now and this is our second one. So, so thank you for having us. Um, also, thank you to everybody that, that's watching. Um, and thank you for participating in, in the process. I, I mean, that's, that's what makes us so great is that you, you can sit back, get your information and, and find out who matches your values the most and, and who's gonna be able to help your family um, in, in your needs the most. Um, and again, you have three great candidates here. Um, again, I'll come back to my experience though. I mean, I don't know if everybody knows this, but in Baldwin City, we, we passed on discrimination ordinance that, that gave um, protection for real or perceived membership in the LGBTQIA plus community, um, gave protection for veterans for age at age 45 and up, for um, familial status, you know, um, and those things were cutting edge for us and, they, and, and we're a rural Kansas. Um, and when I went in, I was super proud, 18, 18 page document, talked to some great people out there, had help, you know, looked at what everybody was doing in Johnson County and, uh, and thought it would pass 5-0. I mean, this is, this is an easy pass. I walk in, make the motion, can't get a second. And this is after two weeks read. So two weeks prior in Baldwin City, it was read as an ordinance. Everybody had time to talk for two weeks to their citizens about protecting everyone. Not just, I mean, vet, even veterans, how do we not have protection for veterans? So the next time, two weeks later, I make the motion, no by seconds. Six weeks later, it passes 5-0. The reason I tell you that is because I went and did something as a straight white male who's not a veteran. I, I do fall in that 45 category. Um, I went out and did that for, for, for the people in our community. Um, and I went from not even being able to get a second to being able to get a 5-0 with compromise and work. Um, you know, I often say, you know, I, I was a college coach for years and I always tell my kids be about it, don't talk about it. Um, all I say is look what I've done, not what I say. Uh, this, is, this is who I am. I battle for, for, for the, the people that are underrepresented. I worry desperately about children that are, that are not eating. Um, They're living in homes that aren't safe. Um, it keeps me up at night. Uh, that, that was me and, and, and in my soul it is. Um, I worry about people not being treated fairly. I worry about people being murdered on the streets by our government. Um, take a look, ajstevens.org. Take a look what I'm about and look at what we're all about. And that's what's really important. Um, who's gonna be able to help you now during a pandemic, day one, who's gonna be able to help you? And, and I believe that's me, thank you. Thank you. Christina? I want to thank, um, you know, Women for Kansas for hosting this forum, the audience for tuning in and engaging in this important primary, and my opponents for standing up and running to represent our community in the Kansas House. Organizations such as Women for Kansas is really important to me and having the support of other organizations such as the Greater Kansas City Women's Political Caucus and Emily's List, and I have a great list of endorsements of strong female leadership um, who are ready to guide me into this new role. Um, I also want to point out that, you know, coming, being Native American, we didn't get citizenship till 1924, and that was just a guaranteed right to vote and for citizenship, but of course, with a lot of rules in our United States history, there was oppression, and it wasn't until 1948 that the last two states in the United States, Arizona and New Mexico, were the last states to expand full voting rights to Native American, Native American women. And, you know, even earlier, more recently, 1952, that gave Japanese Americans and of first generations the citizen and voting rights. So, you know, we are so new to this history of voting and I really appreciate organizations such as yours that grow in expand voices that come from marginalized communities. You know, these all happened less than 100 years ago, 68 years ago and 72 years ago. And, you know, from achieving environmental and racial justice to protect our K through 12 and higher education institutions to working through the economic and public health difficulties presented by COVID-19 virus, there's so much work that needs to be done here in Kansas. And I believe I am the best candidate to work on these challenges on the behalf of our district while serving as a role model for young people and women of color 
who, you know, again, are wondering why they too cannot get involved and have a say in their government. These challenging and unprecedented times and campaigning in this environment has been challenging and unprecedented as well for all of us. And, you know, I wish I could meet out, go out and meet out the voters of District 10 face to face. But until we get this virus under control, I'll be reaching out to you through social media, my phone, and through mail as much as I can. And if you like what I had to say today, um, please get involved with my campaign by submitting a form on my website, Haswood, H-A-S-W-O-O-D-F-O-R-K-A-N-A-S.com, Haswood for Kansas. And please consider donating while you're there. And this primary election presents an incredible opportunity to elect a fresh, bold new generation of representation for Lawrence, Baldwin City, and Southeast Douglas County. And I want to be your voice in the state capitol when the legislature reconvenes in January. And if we put in the work, Democrats will have the numbers to accomplish the goals we've discussed today. And I ask for your vote in the August 4th primary and thank you for considering me to be the next state representative from the District 10. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for participating. I really appreciate you taking the time out. Again, this is going out live and it will be still on um, Women for Kansas Northeast Facebook. So that's W4KNE. And we should have it in about 24 hours on Women for Kansas YouTube channel. So feel free to rewatch and share. And again, this election and the representative for the 10th district will be determined in the primary. So that is a vote on August 4. So please make sure you uh, vote. And thank you again. Thank you everyone, take your time. Yep, thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.